John Paul Lewis Metzger, the Director of the Institute for Cultural Engagement, New Wine, New Wine Skins, and welcome to another episode of New Wine Tastings, where we're seeking to give a taste of new wine, and new wine is about building relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. And what we're dealing with today is the subject of advocacy. Um, we're doing a series on advocacy, a key part of New Wine's work is advocacy, to summon, to call forth, to not replace someone else's voice, and everyone has a voice, but to amplify that voice, to uh, represent that voice, to highlight. And we're interviewing a dear friend, one of our board members for New Wine Skins, uh, Gloria Young. And I'm joined by uh, my partners in crime uh, these days, Trudy Sang and Cody Winnington, uh, pastoral leaders, one in Oregon, that's Trudy, and uh, one in Montana, that's Cody. And Gloria is in the Bay Area. So we're, we're all over the place today, but the questions are not gonna be all over the place. They're gonna be on advocacy. And the title of this um, interview is Advocacy, Never Go It Alone. Never be a lone ranger. Know who's to the right of you, who's to the left of you. Know who's come before you. Know who's going to be following after you. Intentionality, not tunnel vision, peripheral vision, uh, focus, strategic focus, where we're accounting for advocacy in a way that's truly communal. So Gloria, thank you for joining us for this episode of New Wine Tastings. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Gloria, you know, you've had a long career in both politics, uh, city governance, and also in business, in addition to being a Christian leader. And so I think you just bring a, a well, I know you bring a rich, uh, heritage, a rich experience to bear on this theme uh, of advocacy, never go it alone. And you've taught me a lot on this theme and continue to teach me and our new wine community a lot. And Trudy and Cody are both part of that in one way or another. So um, as a leader in the city of Palo Alto and then uh, San Francisco, elsewhere, both politics and business, no doubt you've seen various people who over the years advocate in isolation. I'm assuming that's the case. Or they're looking for what I might call the silver bullet, the golden goose egg. You know, how do I get access to that person over there to advocate? And not really looking around us to see who could be our partners close to home. I can only imagine how difficult it may be and how disastrous it may be for someone to try and do advocacy in isolation. Could you please comment on the importance and the merits of advocating with others? First of all, Paul, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, what I'd like to share is as I prepared for this, I pulled out one of my notebooks and I never know which notebook I'm gonna pull out, but this particular one I pulled out. And on the cover, it says, he will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You will find refuge, Psalm 91, four. Mm. And to me, that's a perfect case for advocacy. Mm our Lord advocating. Uh, when I think about advocacy, I think about the fact that we can talk about advocacy, but talking about advocacy is not advocacy. Advocacy is action. It's taking action. It's a movement. It's an intentional activity. Um, as you stated, I have been involved in the public arena for a long period of time of my life. And I've worked with legislators, I've been a legislator. And so um, I recognize the need to be neutral. I recognize the need to keep confidentiality. I also recognize that there are moments when there is a necessity to step out and to be an advocate. Um, so I think that that is very, very critical to point out in terms of what my career has has been about and um, and how I've uh, found myself advocating for others. Over my career, I have um, had the fortunate opportunity to have allies and advocates. And there's a big difference for me. Mm -hmm. Allies are, we have a mutual benefit in our relationship. And an advocate is willing to step off that cliff. In fact, and in front of me sometimes in order to um, make a right right. 
And so um, that's what I've been able to see. And I hope um, that through my life, I've been able to do that for myself and for others. There have been moments that I've looked back and thought, that was that was a time you should have advocated and you didn't. And so I have learned from my pauses and my being paralyzed in, in certain situations. And so um, I I will attest to that as well. Um, as you know, I created a process around advocacy. And as I created that process, it was an in, uh, an intentional, intuitive process. It was one that looked at how do we relate to each other because relationships are so critical and building those relationships and building them one by one and having a deeper, deeper sense of who that person is. And as you go through that uh, meaningful process to build a relationship, there are steps that we actually go through that maybe we're not aware of. And um, that's what I developed through the humanity model, which is a four step process. It's the awareness, it's the first step where you're learning. Um, you're learning about a person, you're opening up yourself, you're um, allowing yourself to um, have knowledge that you didn't have before, which leads you to the second step, which is acceptance. That's where you're beginning to choose to understand, choose to accept this person. And then you move into your attitude begins to change. You begin to change about what your, maybe your past thoughts, feelings, um, ideas were about that person. And, and then you can then move to advocacy where you're at a place where you're willing to champion and sponsor and be a part of that person's existence. Mm -hmm. So listening, uh, learning, I should say, learning, uh, accepting, and then you said the matter of uh, a real ex um, uh, attitudinal uh, change, transformation, where there's a sense in which you really become one with the person, bound up with accepting them, and then that moves us toward advocacy. So, so there's really some preliminary work. Uh, what you're saying is that you, one just doesn't do advocacy. Uh, you have to listen, you have to learn, you have to accept, you have to embody, you have, you, it involves a, a whole transformation attitudinally and the like, and then advocacy flows from that because you have become one with that person. It's not a separation, it's not an isolation, it's a deep abiding connection. Would that be an accurate um, articulation or where yes. would you push back on that? Thank you, Paul. Yes, it is. It is the fact of um, recognizing that if, in fact, um, you are struggling with the acceptance, you, you're probably needing to know more. You're probably needing to go back to the awareness piece and get some more information. Um, allow yourself to get deeper in terms of your knowledge about what it is and um, about what that experience is with that particular person because you can't jump from awareness to advocacy, as you said. You can't jump from acceptance to advocacy. Your attitude has to change. You have to become a partner with and um, have a strong relationship with. Advocacy does not not just happen just because. And so um, it's very key to um, recognize that. I think about, and you're the theologian, so I'm gonna leave this to you, but um, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I was thinking about Mark 5, where um, the woman was bleeding. Mm -hmm. and she touches the hem of our Lord Jesus's mm -hmm. garment. And um, he, is, he becomes aware uh, because his garment has been touched right? And um, he asks for her to share, and she shares and confesses. And so um, through that, um, he accepts, and his attitude is that he then advocates for her when he, in fact, cures her and sends her off um, on her way, being cured. He, he stepped out, and he advocated for her. They then had a relationship. And so for me, when I, when I think about um, that in terms of relating to people in any um, part of my life, I think about those stories in the Bible that also ground in 
where our Lord Jesus Christ was in fact an advocate. In so love, many ways. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I just said in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's a beautiful story. And I so appreciate you drawing at our attention to that story in Mark. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, you know, I'd have to go and look at the parallel text. I'm thinking of, I believe it's the one, the, 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 that account in Luke, um, and it might show up in the various synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where uh, at least in one of the accounts, Jesus uh, says, and probably in all the accounts, he says, uh, you know, basically, you're clean, you're whole, uh, calls her a daughter. And what he, uh, is really saying in part, he's advocating for her with the synagogue ruler close by. Jairus, the synagogue ruler, is right there. And Jesus is on his way, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to Jairus' house. Uh, any of you can correct me on this. This is just off the top, off the top of my head. Uh, but, I'm glad you're putting that position to be off the top of your head too, Paul. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, but what, what is striking to me is how the Lord... Uh, I believe wants the synagogue ruler to know that this woman in your surroundings here, this, this woman who had an issue of blood, spent all her money, all that she had to try and cure herself of that and couldn't. Mm -hmm. And with uncleanness, you know, from uh, discharge, she, she was permanently unclean. So what does that mean for her being a part of the synagogue community? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, she's healed. She's whole. She is a daughter. So welcome her back. He is advocating for her. He builds on her own self-advocacy. You know, even if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And he, she's healed when and when she touched that faith. And he says, okay, who touched me? Who touched me? Like, Are you mad? His disciples are like, you're being swarmed upon. And But he really is not trying to embarrass her. He is highlighting her, drawing attention, and so that he can advocate for her. So I just, I think it's beautiful that you bring that kind of, it's one of my favorite um stories in the gospels and we he is by no means shaming her he is he is highlighting her and welcoming her calling for her to be welcomed into the community and so i you know you you asked me you know you know paul you know you let give your own thoughts or you have to make an assessment as a theologian well i was thinking about bob dylan i've been thinking a lot about bob dylan these days he turned 80 and um i listened to a lot of his music all the time and Two songs that really strike me, and you know, he was known for listening well mm -hmm. to the times in which he lived back then. I think even now, and you know, he he was a mouthpiece for a movement. He never saw himself as a uh, an um, an activist as such. Joan Baez got really upset with him because she wouldn't he wouldn't do some of the things. But he marked the March on Washington. He was there singing. Uh, I think before Dr. King came up and. Uh, also, though, he wrote two songs that really strike me about race and racism. One is um, Hurricane, uh, about the boxer who was wrongly charged, um, uh, put in prison for life. He was released later. Uh, but Hurricane, uh, about the, the boxer because of his race, mm -hmm. was, you know, was charged with killing someone. And but he listened. He listened. He, when he met with the boxer, it was just like, wanting to have a connection when they met. He was listening, he was learning from him, feeling him. Same thing with Blind Willie McTell, who never, which never made it onto his album with Infidels, but it's a powerful song about slavery and racism. It's one of his best, both of them are. But he listened, he listened, he intuited a movement and intuited movements. And uh, so that's what I'm thinking, whether that's theologically alert or not, uh, I, I like to think in terms of music a lot, and especially Dylan's and Cobain's. But this is this is a, a amazing what you're sharing, uh, Cody and Trudy. Thoughts that you have? Just leave Dylan out of it, okay? Leave Dylan out of it. So, based on what you're hearing from Gloria, any thoughts you have? I, I appreciate the attitude of investment of time because you just can't jump to conclusions because people and situations are so complex and I appreciate that posture that you're taking. Thank you, Trudy. I think I appreciated the uh, distinguishing between ally and advocate. Um, 
I think those are those are important distinctions that are often missed. Um, certainly upon myself, um, even here in the language of, of ally versus advocate, you're trying to figure out the type of difference. Uh, so I appreciated your distinguishing that. And um, the, the four steps to advocacy of learning acceptance change and, and then actually advocating, um, I just think that, that that puts some helpful language to what I think most of us experience in everyday life. Um, the most productive conversations, the most productive actions, uh, typically will follow that pattern uh, from my experience. And so it provides a nice tool or resource to put some language to it. So uh, that's very helpful for me in my context, Gloria. So thank you for that. Thank you, Cody. It's the, it's four A's. Is um, it's the awareness, it's the acceptance, it's the attitude, and it's the advocacy. And and um, what you said about in everyday life, I you know when I presented this one time to some business leaders, and I use the the analogy of I don't know if you remember that commercial where it was a little boy and they said, Mikey, Mikey, give it to Mikey. Mikey will do anything or Mikey will eat anything. And, and Mikey was always asking the question, why? You know, he wanted to have more information. He wanted to have more knowledge. He, before, you know, he would, you know, do something. And so um, I think that that is um, a part of our human nature is that we don't, um, there's an expectation maybe from society and from others that we are going to do X quickly. And um, it's not necessarily the case. Thank you very much for those reflections. Um, okay. Thanks again for those uh, reflections. And I wanted to turn the question now to the following. What are the what are a few examples of advocacy, Gloria, that you have observed? Um, perhaps one involving uh, advocating in a community or advocating with others, and uh, another where someone tried to advocate going it alone. Uh, what well, it could be that you know they just they weren't listening. That they, they should have been advocating with the person they were representing, but they didn't. Or it could be a matter of you know, where it would require advocating in a group of people. Dr. King, it was a community, the beloved community, it was a community of people advocating. He didn't do it alone. Uh, what would be an example or two that you can draw from where people did it together and one or two where they did it in isolation and what the effects of both were? Mm. Um, I have several examples. I'm not sure that they hit all of your points, but I will um, share the examples that come to mind. One um, example, and I've shared this quite a bit with you and others, is the one um, Cookie and Bob Wall and I all worked for the city of Palo Alto for years. I was the city clerk and Cookie was my assistant and Bob Wall was the fire chief. And Palo Alto is an outstanding organization. It, um, the city is primarily about 80 to 85% white and very small percentages of the other um, nationalities in that city, ethnicity in the city. And so my being in the position I was, was rare. Um, for that city. And um, we had had a um, city manager that was also African American. So we both were at the top of the organization. Um, the example that I will share is that um, the fire department, the unions um, throughout the state of California had planned a huge event. They did it yearly to, I believe it was with the um, Special Olympics, but it could have been another event, but it was a huge, huge event. And um, it was an honor that it was being held in the city of Palo Alto. And so the um, president of the union invited me as a guest and said, you know, I'm inviting you and we would love for you to come and be at this event and also, you know, be present with us um, at the banquet table. And so I felt really honored by that. And then he proceeded to share with me that it was going to be held at the Elks Club in Palo Alto. Well, at the time, the Elks Club did not allow minorities or women um, into the club. So I said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to come. And, um, and you know, I, I shared with him what my, my reasonings was. Well, for him, the event was more, was 
what his emphasis and his interest and his attention was. So he said, well, maybe next year. And so that was the end of that conversation. And um, again, here was a perfect example of ally. He was an ally, he wasn't willing to step off the cliff for me in advocacy. And so um, I had dinner with Cookie and Bob and um, I was sharing with Bob did he know that this was going to be held at the Elf Club? And um, and Bob said, no. And I said, so are you planning on going? And um, he said, well, you know, I'm the chief and I may have to go just to welcome people in. So I, I didn't say- uh, Chief of the fire department, right? Chief of the right, fire department. Of the fire department and so um that that next day that was on a sunday the next day was monday the event was being held on wednesday and so um the very next day you know i was sharing with cookie uh about my um thoughts and feelings about what bob had expressed and she's you know she reiterated the fact that he was the chief and and as a chief he had a responsibility um and so you know, and I said, I do too. And I basically shared, I, I needed to rethink what our relationship was. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so um, the next day, that after, that was the next day, that afternoon, um, Bob came up and he shared, he asked if I could bring Cookie into my office. And he said, you know, I've given it some thought. And he said, I've determined that, um, I won't allow any of my officers to go there, my fire department staff to go there in um, uniforms representing the city of Palo Alto or with any of their, uh, the city of Palo Alto's fire equipment. They can go to that event if they choose to do so, but we won't have it being represented as if we're supportive of it being at the Elf Club. And that was huge for me because um, he was stepping out in his support for me, um, and not only me, because I knew that it was it affected the women that worked for the fire department, the women firefighters, and everyone of color that worked for the fire department. And um, when he shared that with the uh, with the um, union president, um, there was, you know, he was not very happy with me and he was not very happy with Bob. Within 24 hours, that event that was going to have people from all over um, California and from outside the state as well, media, celebrities, everyone, that event was changed from the Elf Club to another event uh, conference center across the street at another hotel within 24 hours. Something like that was just amazing to me. And we had shared it with the mayor. And um, so when we went to the event, we were all holding hands because we knew people were not going to be happy with us for what they had to do. Um, uh, but we felt, I felt so blessed that Bob had stepped out and made that kind of commitment that said, you know, how much he believed in relationships and how much he, he recognized um, bigotry and racism and, and was, you know, willing to take that, that um, stance. And as a result of that, you know, we walked in and, and later on some of the women and some of the, um, the minority firefighters came up to me and they said, thank you, thank you so much. If it wasn't for you, this wouldn't happen. And I said, I need to, you know, correct you on that. It would, this event would have gone on because it was gonna go on. You know, I made my stance and I wasn't gonna go, but until Bob stepped out and changed the landscape of that, that's who you need to be recognizing and acknowledging because he made such a difference in that event. And even every time I share it, and I probably shared it a thousand times, I always feel this, you know, this sense in my heart that that was such an amazing and special situation that occurred. And um, another example I will give you, and it's also at City Palo Alto. Well, it doesn't, it, um, it goes without saying, I worked there for 25 years, so a lot of my experiences were with the city of Palo Alto. I was blessed by them as well. Um, it happened to be an unfortunate situation. It was a physicist, a, a white physicist who had come to uh, spend some time at 
HP, Hewlett Packard, and was working there. And he happened to be running um, in the streets of Palo Alto. Um, and so what had occurred is that he was murdered, as he sat on a bench um, near, very close to the city of Palo Alto. And, um, and so the, uh, it happened on uh, one day, the next morning, when I was headed to work, the whole area around City Hall and around this particular area where it had occurred was all caution taped off. So I got into my office and I always got there early. And um, the public information officer from the police department came up immediately and said, um, we need to get this press release out. We need to get you to get the mayor's approval of it. And it needs to be distributed to all of the news media um, so that we can, you know, start um, getting out the description of the suspects. So I read the um, the press release, and the press release described the horrific situation that had occurred to this this man. And then it said there uh, the suspects are two men presumed to be black. And um, I read that sentence and I went, uh, I don't think I can share this with the mayor. I don't think I can let this go out because it is presumption. There is no real evidence that they're African-American. And I said, you have um, people, fi police um, personnel, including officers that are working in this building that the minute they get off work, and take off their uniforms and walk on the streets of Palo Alto, they could be presumed to be the suspect. Um, it's, you know, I'm, you're setting anyone up that's an African-American walking down the street. And so um, the police chief came up and he was, um, you know, wanting to make sure that this occurred. And, um, and, and so um, I, I just said no and kept saying, you know, this has to shift, this has to change um, before we did. We allowed this to go out and I was not going to, you know, um, hand it over to the mayor. And um, I did end up talking to the mayor and we both decided that that was not something that was going to go forth. So it shifted and it changed. And what occurred um, within a couple of days is that they had caught the suspects. And so there was a press conference um, in our chambers. And so everybody was in our chambers. And um, I was there with a group of um, African-Americans that happened to work at City Hall. We were standing together, um, concerned that it would be um, Black men that had caused this, this um, situation and were suspects. And when they announced it, it wasn't. Um, it was Asian American. And we um, breathed a sigh of relief. And what I saw, which I will never forget again, is that the Asians came together and kind of stood together, not breathing a sigh of relief, but having fear in their faces. And um, what that taught me and um, really provoked in me was the fact that as minorities, if someone, one of us does something wrong, all of us feels it. And I don't think that's um, very true of the prominent race, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely something that um, I saw witnessed right there because I never would have thought that until I saw them kind of come together and kind of shudder. And I thought, you know, here we are in a situation where it's not us that did it, it's the suspects that did it, but the race is feeling the impact. Mm. So those are yeah. two of my examples. Yeah, those are powerful examples. And, uh, you know, and I think presently even about uh, what, what Asian Americans and Asian American women face uh, in our country. And, you know, and you think about the language of China virus and, and, and all that, or Chinese virus, uh, those are deeply disturbing words, and uh, it's it's deeply problematic. And, and we have to speak out exactly. with others. And and the same thing with what you're talking about here, Gloria. That you know, presumed black, uh, presumed black, presumed this, presumed that, and uh, we don't realize how damaging uh, those statements are often. And we need to make people aware of that. 
And, you know, it's striking because uh, we're interviewing Bob for this series uh, on conflict resolution skills and sets. And, uh, you know, Bob is a very quiet, soft-spoken person, but once he makes up his mind, you can't budge him. And uh, it was it was striking and once he was speaking at uh, a new wine retreat because he was fire chief of Portland later brought here to diversify the Portland Fire Department. And he said you would never experience so much nepotism than in a fire department because, you know, uncles, grandfathers, fathers, et cetera, you know, they stay in the line. And so he got pushback uh, a lot of times. And, and Gloria said, well, don't forget to mention the death threats he received. Oh, yes. He said it through, you know, he just kind of, oh, yeah. OK. So, you know, because she wondered coming out of their house in the Portland area, nice part of yeah. the, 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 the area. Just would there be some with the guns because the threat he was getting for diversifying Portland. So, you know, on, on in the fire department. So, you know, you mentioned how he came alongside and Cookie came alongside as not just allies, but advocates. You also exhorted and pushed them. And I it just the, the the evolution of that relationship, you know, you're a, a powerful threesome. Uh, the evolution of that relationship and how you said, I have to re revisit, reconsider our relationship. You know, if you're not going to and, and that really caused them to, I think it was a baptism for, for everyone. So to speak. So we go through that. We go through that yeah. and they listen, they learn, they, they identified with, and then there was that advocacy. Beautiful. We've Beautiful. been blessed with our relationship, Bob um, and Cookie both had me come up and spend time with them when they were looking at um, the fact that Bob's work on diversifying the fire department in Portland was considered to be the chief's program. It was written up that way. Again, we have to be so careful when we are dealing with language, whether it's presumed, whether it's um, you know um, attesting to one to a major process or major program being aligned with that person, so that if that person walks away, so does the program. And Bob was very um, clear about the fact that the work that he had done and the work that had been um, started needed to continue whether he was there or not. So it was, how do we uh, make this organic? How do we allow this, this, what we've established here to be something that was maintained and that was allowed to grow in, um, in Oregon? So I came up and worked with him on that as well, him and Cookie, and we established the process around that as well. And, so. and did you change the language from Chief's program? Yes, we did. We and it was all done very intentionally. We um, we set up a process where we brought in the, the deputies and we brought in um, some of the um, line staff, uh, firefighters and um, women, men, um, people of color. And we worked with them over, I think it was like a 10 week process and came out with a program where there would be a, um, a group uh, that would be a panel of, um, of, uh, of, that it consisted not only of the deputy chiefs, but also the staff people, so that they would continue to look at this process and see how it grows. And that was something that came out of us having those meetings where they wanted to ensure that it would continue and that there would always be new blood coming into that group and you know and uh, transition so that it would never get stale so it, it um and it was really well received at the time that bob was retiring so by the time and he was retiring so what was the title of the program uh eventually was the title change uh, I can't remember what the program was called. Bob would probably be better at that than I, I am. I know that um, we, we had some really cute initials and it, I forgot what it said, whether it was PA something or, or um, it, but it was a group that, um, that, you know, after we went through the process of creating again, um, People that had, you know, even though they worked in the same department um, and, and we had the ranks involved, it was a matter of having established relationships. That that um, process and that 
program did not come out of Bob and I. It, it evolved out of those folks that were participating. And so that made it a staple. And that's so key. Uh, and, and the reason why I asked about the name change and other things is because if it's, if it's tied up to an individual or just an office, we're basically shooting ourselves in the foot because it won't become a movement. Mm -hmm. But when there's ownership in Abbey's, and that's the point about community, when there's ownership, who's the right of us, who's the left, who's coming after us, who comes before us, uh, even what you said, well, you need to thank the chief, you know, or let's not make it just the chief's program. Uh, it's it's a community because then it has it it sticks it, it the potential for it to stick is much greater and you're doing that even with new wine you're thinking okay boardsmanship who comes after us you know what's the connection between me and new wine there has to be distinction because otherwise it's going to flop and I think that you know we have to constantly be about community and in advocacy work it's about community and I think those are powerful stories. Uh, moving further into this, uh, I've noted in our work together how important it is in your estimation to be aware of who is to the right of us and who's to the left, who came before us and who will come after us in, in, in terms of the work of advocacy. I remember you saying once to me, I don't know if it was in a meeting in San Francisco, but some uh, you had just gotten done saying, you know, look to who's to the right of you and who's to the left of you. And a couple of people came up knowing your role in the city, uh, your office and such. Well, Gloria is going to be able to connect me with so and so, so they can advocate mm -hmm. for what I'm after in a certain domain. And he said, actually, the person literally who is to the right of you, who is to the left of you at the table, knows so and so better than I do. I see this almost all the time. We we look for the people who are successful, who've already arrived, and we just think automatically. They're the ones. That's the silver bullet. That's the it's the golden goose egg, and we're not looking at who might be our allies and even more so in this case, advocates, right, right to the right of us and who's the left of us. Right. The lack of the tunnel vision is killing us. We need peripheral vision. So, do you want to speak to that at all, please? Well, I appreciate that, and I, you know, I love that um, that uh, reminder of um, when I was I was speaking at the Arts Institute here in San Francisco. And I was sharing about the government and, and sharing about my role and my responsibilities and, um, and, and inter interacting with the, um, the group that was there, the students that were there. And um, afterwards, as you said, Paul, this one student came up, she came up with her, her friend who was sitting next to her. And um, she proceeded to say, this is the kinds of things I'm interested in. And, um, and she said, you know, would you mind? And she just, you know, she went on and on and on. And her friend was saying, I didn't know you were interested in that. You never shared that about wanting to get um, in touch with so-and-so. And she goes, you know, um, my sister is with that department. My sister knows that person really well. I can make that connection for you. I don't know why we've never had that kind of conversation. Well, as you said, Paul, she was into tunnel visions and she just kept saying to me, when can you, when can you set, can I get to have coffee with you? Can you, you know, can we talk more about this? And I had to say, you know, let's, let's pause for a second, <laughs> you know, uh, let's take a, let's take a pause. Um, what you, I don't know whether you've heard what, you know, your, your uh, colleague, has, your friend has just said, she is more capable of putting you in the right space to talk to this particular person than I am. And I said, you know, you need, we need to always be paying attention because obviously you're focused on me because I was the center of attention here speaking. In reality, she has the, uh, the opportunity and the ability to to really push what you're interested in um and that's who you should be paying attention to and you know it's as you said it's something that happens all the time you know we look to the person on the stage that is presenting we we don't necessarily think about the people that are to the left of us and to the right of us and in, in front of us or in back of us we don't think about them as being the person that can really speak into our lives or or really um provide us with the kind of nourishment um that we need we're so focused on whoever it is that is um 
is the leader or who we think has uh, the information, the knowledge, and that may not necessarily be the case. So we need to be paying attention. I always say that, you know, um, mm -hmm. there was years and years ago, they used to talk about six degrees of separation. And I truly believe we're one degree of separation from mm -hmm. anyone we could possibly ever want to know mm -hmm. or, or be in, in touch with. Or, and, and so I think that that makes it even more valuable to know your neighbor. That's powerful. That's really, really powerful. And, you know, just even in terms of those who've come before, you know, I think of my parents. Um, where would I be without my parents? Um, who, I mean, they spent their lives advocating for me, right? You know, from yeah. before yeah. birth onward. Uh, for And, you know, I would look right past them. And now after they've passed, I'm always looking to them. In my own son's situation with his traumatic brain injury, I have their picture in his room. He loved them, or he loves them. He adores them. Uh, I still remember what he said at my mom's memorial, his grandma's memorial service, because all the grandkids were there and they got up each one, or some of them, he was one of the representatives to speak, Christopher was. And, um, and there are times I call on them, you know, and whether that's theologically accurate or not, you know, who cares? <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I just say, you know, be there with them, be there with them, and you know, and they, and they, they live on. And I think they continue to advocate. Of course, the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, the author and perfecter of our faith, and the great cloud of witnesses, which they're a part of. Um, you know, they're they're cheering him on, and they're cheering us on. And I think we we need to know where we came from. And who's to the right of us? Who's to the left of us? Who's going to come after us? And you're you're always a person of great intentionality and, and great strategic thinking. It's amazing. Yeah, you don't you don't rest on those matters, Gloria. And that kind of communal vision is really key. So often people are looking for the silver bullet, as I said earlier. Like, okay, put me in touch with that famous one, uh, or the golden goose egg. Uh, the well-positioned leader to advocate with or to get them to advocate on one's behalf. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't look to get advocacy from different people. It could be a senator. It could be a congressman. I've had to do that before. Um, but we often fail to see, as I said, how important, potential, how much importance there might be with those right around the corner from us. Uh, one degree of separation, our neighbors, et cetera, family members, uh, and their potential import as advocates. What would you encourage people to do to take inventory, further to what we just got done talking about, to take inventory in discerning the potential impact around us of people who would serve as advocates? Good question. Um, I think that I would come from a place of just really recognizing that um, if we stay in the eye, if we stay in the place of not looking around and paying attention to who's within our vicinity, of being able to reach out and recognize that when we connect with people, when we um, have an opportunity to share and get to know someone, um, we become a we and we can move into community. Um, we can stay isolated, that's a choice. And it's a choice for us to move into relationships, to, re to move into, as we've said before, the pebble on the stream that ripples. Um, we have an opportunity to make a difference when we do that. I was thinking about um, that question. And again, I think it was an interesting one. And I was thinking about, um, I don't know if you recall, Alvin Toffler, who wrote um, uh, Future Shock and uh, Third Wave, and his last book was Revolutionary Wealth, and I met him at, um, when he was finishing up what Revolutionary Wealth. I was part of a focus group that he had, and he developed a process, and I matched it up with um, the advocacy model, and his was, was that, you know, you, you've got to pay attention to how you learn, how you relate, how you believe, and how you choose which really equates to how you learn is awareness, how you relate is your acceptance, how you believe
call writing books and all of the things that take place. We are in our own worlds trying to make sure that we connect with people, we have relationships with people, we provide information and knowledge that really um, opens up our hearts, our souls, and our minds um, to be a better community um, and to exist in a better place than we, than we are now. Yeah, that's it's beautiful. And, you know, where would my family and I be right now with the people uh, advocating for us. I mean, I don't know how people do it in situations like what we're facing with our son's traumatic brain injury if they're in isolation. Um, you know, I, I see all the more the importance of relationships, <laughs> all the more, not less and less, all the more. And I covet relationships, good relationships. I, I do not want to be a fool. I've been a fool way too long anyway. Um, I'm tired of being a fool, <laughs> but uh, and I think that what you're getting at with that the those fears of you know again the listening the the learning the um, accepting the attitudinal change and then the advocacy as Trudy said Gloria you know it, it's it, the, there's a patient process uh, that goes on there and it's it's so vital and um, hindsight foresight and good peripheral vision is important if we wish to advocate well and most effectively. Are there any closing thoughts you wish to share, Gloria, and any closing thoughts just very briefly in response to what you share uh, or what you've shared from uh, Cody and Trudy? So Gloria first. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you, Trudy and Cody, um, for participating in this conversation. And I just like to close with a poem that I had wrote um, for another event, and it's called We Choose. Mm -hmm. How can we see beyond what is visible? We choose. We choose to live in a world where the tapestry of humankind is loved, valued, respected, and cherished. We choose to open our hearts to God's great creation. We choose to love one another as God so loved the world. We choose to walk with one another, sharing each other's joys, success, pain, and hardship. We choose to be alive to serve one another, recognizing we live in a world where service is desperately needed. We choose to honor and respect those who are different from ourselves embracing race, ethnicity, backgrounds, and beliefs. We choose to be the chosen people. We choose to be God's people. Mm. We choose. Mm. Great intentionality and in action. Uh, it's all about that intentionality and action. We choose to be God's chosen people. I love that play on words uh, too, that the choice, the strategic initiative, the yeah, beautiful. So Trudy and Cody. All right, um, thank you. That poem's beautiful. Um, that's very beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I think that I really appreciated the reminder that to slow and pause, to take the time, that intentionality of really understanding because sometimes I think when we get really into an idea or a concept or a cause, I, I know that I can get really blind, you know, kind of blinders up and then we don't see the full picture. And I, you know, I think that having that perspective of pause and really learning and seeing the deeper undercurrent of what could happen like your examples of the language of what could happen if it, and sometimes we skim the surface and I appreciate that, that encouragement to go deep. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Gloria, thank, thank you as well for that poem. I uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, your, I don't know, your final comments, um, I think are gonna, are gonna linger with me for a little bit when you talked about uh, the Paul's question to take inventory of the advocacy. And, you know, you mentioned that we need to 
remove the I, remove our isolation tendency. And um, I think that um, if I heard you correctly, what what tends to happen is if we isolate, it actually renders our advocacy to be um, ineffective or not as effective as um, which actually is counterproductive for those whom we're trying to advocate. And so um, that's a good reminder that solo advocacy is not generally speaking um, full advocacy on behalf of others. And so because this, it's kind of puts the self at the center, even if unintentionally. And so that's a good reminder. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Well, Gloria, I always learn a lot. And, uh, you know, you just, you've been a great mentor to me and continue to be and just uh, uh, just grateful for how you advocate for new wine. And uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's a gift. You're a gift. So thank you, Gloria. And uh, thank you, Trudy and Cody as well for your input. Uh, for Gloria Young, Trudy Sang, Cody Winnington, and myself, Paulus Metzger, uh, we're signing off. And thank you for joining us for this theme of advocacy and never to go it alone. Blessings to you all. Goodbye. Bye.